Okay, page 70. Um, we started a few psukim about Perak Tezayin, Perak 16. Okay? So Hashem made the covenant with Avram Avinu last week. We discussed the seven nations have to do with the seven emotional levels. The three levels of Kani, Kinesi, and Kadmeni, our future. When Mashiach comes, is going to be, the intellect is going to be refined also. Okay. So, Sada Eishas Avram, Okay, page 74 lines on the top of the page. <coughs> Sarai, the wife of Avram, Layodolai, she, she didn't give birth to him. Like we learned before, Sarai didn't have any children. Um, uh, and she had this maid from Egypt whose name was Hagar. This Hagar, like we learned last time, was the, the daughter of Para, the king of Egypt. And she said it's better to be a maidservant in the house of Soda, or her father said even, than to be a princess in the house of Paro. And you have to remember, Mitzrayim was the superpower of the world at that time. So it was a big thing being the princess in Egypt. But nevertheless, Hogard was, um, it was better for her to be, okay. So now we're ta- this we learned already. Tell me, sorry, Alavram, sorry, said Tavra. He may not, Atzadani Hashem, he led this. Hashem held me back from giving birth, okay? Bono al Shivchasi, marry, you know, come to my maidservant. Ula Ibana Mimana, maybe I will build from her. He said, maybe I'll have children from her. Maybe the problem is me, not you. Because maybe Avram could have children. Sorry, I couldn't have children. So she said, you know what, marry Hagar. And Ula Ibana Mimana. He said last week also an interesting concept. Ibana literally means build. Bone. But Ibone, also the root of the word is Ben. Have a child. Because first of all, children build the next generation. I mean, so there is building. But Yishma Avram calls Sarai. Okay? Now, why did Sarai do this? So Mephoshim explained the Bible. Now says, Avram, Sarai was afraid. Listen, Avram's going to want to have kids. Because God promised him he's going to have kids, right? God never promised Sarah she's going to have children. In the Brisbane of Sodom, Avram Avinu said to Hashem, what do you want from me? I, I'm going barren. I don't have any kids. It's working? Yes, I think it is. It's not warm. Huh? Not warm. Takes time to warm up. Okay. Is it open? Huh? Is it open? No. I see air coming out. Yeah, that's good. Cold? It's not warm. Okay, so she, he's, so Sarah was afraid that Babinal explains. Sarah was afraid that Avram is going to take another wife. Because listen, Hashem promised Avram is going to have kids, right? Sarah seems to be the problem because Avram is going to have kids. So Sarah said, you know what's going to happen? He's going to take another wife, and then I'll really be out. Let me give him my maidservant. She'll remain my maidservant, even though she's going to marry Avram. And therefore, at least I'll have some control, so to speak, over this situation. And that's why she said, I mean, what's the emphasis, Shivchasi? Because she wanted to still have control over it. And Avram listened to the voice of Sarai. Meaning, it doesn't say that he did it. He listened to the voice of Sarai. Meaning, he only did it because Sarai agreed to it, and she instituted it, initiated it, instituted it. And because this is what the Ramban says, this is what Sarai wanted. And therefore, Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. Right. What? So, um, basically, Mitzrayim were from Ham, weren't they? From yeah. Which were cursed. Because Hagar became a Yid, basically. I mean, she became a... She lived in Avram's house, so she became a convert. <laughs> Don't forget, then converts meant believing in one God. So she believed in God, so it's... Uh... Okay, so basically it says, not because Avram Avinu wanted other women, it's just he listened to Sarai, and that's why he did it. So Sarai took, we'll soon see what it means she took, what it means she took her. 
As Hagar Amitzvah says, Shiv Chasa, she took uh, Hagar, her maidservant. Um, again, what does it mean? Not a physical taking, but like emotional speech taking. She said to look how lucky you are to marry Avram, he's such a great holy man, you're going to marry him. And uh, in other words, uh, uh, also uh, the Ramban says he didn't rush into it, Avram Avini, he went slow into it. You know, he took her, he did, it was, took time. And it says, After 10 years, that Avram lived in the land of Canaan, and I'll explain in a second, and she gave her to Avram, her husband, as a wife. Okay, so basically what happened is the Pasuk is saying a few things. Number one, it was after 10 years, and not Stam 10 years, 10 years that he lived in Canaan, in the land of Israel. Okay, so what's this emphasis? First of all, there's a very interesting halacha which Shulchan Aruch says is not done today. But if somebody is married to a woman without uh, 10 years without children, and Shulchan Aruch says you should divorce her and marry a second wife, to be able, because you have the mitzvah approval, right? So marry a second wife and divorce the first wife. So years ago, before Rabbeinu Gershom, was around that you were allowed to have more than one wife. So you didn't have to divorce the wife who didn't have children. You could have just married another woman, right? And then you'd have children for the, you didn't have to divorce her. But um, the halacha is, again, in Shekhanarach it says after 10 years you're supposed to divorce your wife if you don't have children. The Pearl Shekhanarach says it's not done today. As we see, even great tzaddik and didn't have children, they didn't divorce the wives after 10 years. That's number one. Number two, it says over here that um, 10 years that he lived in the land of Canaan. Okay? What does this mean? It says, um, because the married years before Canaan, and Canaan was Eretz Yisrael, right? The Holy Land. Before the Canaan, years that marriage didn't count. He didn't count that in the reckoning of the marriage years. Now he came to Eretz Yisrael, he was there for 10 years, and she didn't have any children, so now he did what he did, based on what Sarah told him to do, only because Sarah told him to do, but that's what he did. Okay, um, next. By Yahweh al Hagar. Okay, so basically, after 10 years, Sarah took Hagar, gave it to Avram as a wife, but... Again, the interesting thing is, even though she was his wife, she was still Sarah's maidservant. And Avram Avinu, when Sarah said, Even Avram considered her still the maidservant of Sarah. That wasn't 100% like a regular wife and so on. Okay. But Yahweh al Hagar, he came, lived with Hagar, it means. Uh, and she became pregnant. This is one of the few unique situations because normally the Gemara says a woman can't become pregnant from the first time having intimacy. We find a few exceptions. Of Chumash Light and his two daughters, they became pregnant right away even though it was one time of intimacy. And this is the second, well, this is first. And Avram and Hagar, that Hagar became pregnant right away from the first time they were intimate. Okay, now, Medr says, okay, this is unusual, and, uh, but it had to be for exceptional reasons. Okay. She conceived, she became pregnant. She saw that she became pregnant. Hagar saw that she became pregnant. And her mistress, meaning Sarah, was lowered in her eyes. What she did, she was fortunate, you know, not a Yiddish girl. She went around telling everybody, ah, everybody would say how great Sarah was, you know. They say, you see, she's not so great. She was married so many years without kids. And look at me, the first time I'm with Avram Avino, I got, the, I got a kid, I'm greater than her. So she looked down with contempt to Sarah. And because now... Was uh, Hogger said, You see, this that God promised you those kids, 
it's all through me, not Sara. So she started knocking and putting down Sara. Okay, so that a timer and, and Sara didn't let it. Sara didn't like it, I mean. She didn't like that. The maidservant is coming and putting her down. But Taimir al Sarai, Taimir Sarai al Avram, so Sarai said to Avram, Chamasi Alecha, my outrage is upon you. It's because of you. She blamed Avram Avinu for, for Hagar becoming pregnant. Why? So she, the, the Mephashim explained like this. Sarah said to Avram, when you davened for a child, you only davened for yourself to have a child. You didn't daven that we should have a child. So Hagar says to her, I mean, the Sarah says to Avram, it's your fault. Did you daven for us to have a child? You daven, you should have a child. Like Avram told Hashem before, I don't have any children, I don't have any children. And Eliezer, what's Eliezer, you know? So, Sarah said to him, why didn't you daven for us? The Medrash gives an analogy of this. There are two prisoners in a, in a dungeon, dungeon. One came, the king was passing by, and one of the prisoners screamed out to the king, have mercy on me, you know, free me. So the king had pity on him, Rahmanus on him, and he let him go. So the other prisoners saw that what the guy did, he didn't say, have mercy on us. Because then the king, king would have redeemed both of them. He said, have mercy on me, you only care about yourself. So he, he got angry at him. The same thing, Sarah got angry at Avram. The fact that Hagar had a kid, and that means he didn't daven for both of them, he only davened for himself. Okay, and also, by the way, Hamasi um, Aleha, Okay, Hamasi means my anger. But if you remember by the Mabul, it says, Vatimale Ha'aretz Hamas. The earth was full of robbery. She said, You stole my kid. You're stealing uh, this kid from me by not davening and not begging for Hashem. Okay, so, so now the Mephoshim Taka asks, Why Taka didn't? Avram was a very nice person, right? He personified Chesed. Right? It says in Sefer Abohir, which was in the earliest, earliest Kabbalah Svarim, it says that the attribute of chesed, the attribute of kindness, came to complain to Hashem. And he said, from the day Avram Avinu was born, he took away my whole attribute of chesed. He was completely personifying chesed. And now that he's born, he, I don't, I don't, I'm out of a job. The attribute of chesed said, I'm out of a job. Okay, so Avram Avinu is chesed. Why didn't he daven for his wife? Why didn't he? So Mephashim explained different answers. One answer is that he, he knew Sarah was barren, like he said before, but she didn't even have a womb. So Avram Avinu said, you know what? You can't ask too much from God. You know, to ask for me to have a child and for Sarah to have a womb and have a child, he said, you know, it's a little bit too much to ask. So therefore, I'm not, I can't. I can't go far. Go, go go that much. So if somebody is uh, davening for somebody to have a child, they should uh, they should yeah, daven for the husband and wife. They should daven for both. For both. Right. Now, um, there is a very famous question that the Mefarshim ask. It's a Gemara, the Medrash. Sarah was barren. Rivka was barren, Rachel was barren, Chana was barren. Why did God make all these great, 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 great women, prophets and, and great tzaddikim and, and everything, why did Hashem make them barren? To make them closer to them. What? To make them closer to them so that they pray. Oh, so it says, it's interesting, it says, Hashem loves when tzaddikim pray. Shem loves him, so he can pray. So how does he get a tzaddik to pray? He makes him problems. If they don't have problems, they're not going to daven, right? So how do you daven? How do you get them to daven? You make them suffer. So he makes Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Khan and all these people not have children, that they should go daven. 
And also it says, another thing was, it's a very interesting answer, the matter says, you know, a woman after having children is not the same grace and beauty, and you know. So Hashem wanted to have grace and beauty for a longer period of time, have their youth for an extended period of time, so Hashem made that they shouldn't have children. Okay, anyway, so this is, um, so, okay, we're in the middle of the passing. My anger is up due to you, okay? I gave your maidservant in your bosom, meaning I gave it to you, okay? And to your lap. And he said, And she saw, she, she's telling Avram Avinu what happened. Okay? She's telling Avram the story because Avram probably didn't see that Hagar was making fun of Sarah that she's not so great. Right? So Sarah is telling Avram, let me tell you what's going on over here. I gave you Hagar as a wife. I was a nice guy. And then she got pregnant. And I, now she made me low in her eyes. Right? So Hashem said, Yishbit Hashem benecha. May the Lord judge between you and between me. Okay? Sarah said, I can't do anything now because she's your wife. What do you want me to do? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Avram said, I can't because, uh, you know, you have a, she's your wife. I, I'm stuck. Okay? So uh, she says, basically, call the shots. She says to Avram, call the shots. What to do? This can't go on like this. Okay? Avram al Sarai. So Avram said to Sarai like this. Your maidservant is in your hand. Meaning, even though she's my wife, but she was first Shivchaseh. She was first your maidservant. So he says to her, She's in your hand. Do to her whatever you see fit. Okay? Now, one hand, Avram Avinu was all bothered over here. From one side, you know, Sarah is his wife. From one side, he, you know, Hagar got pregnant. Hashem wanted that to happen. Like he's stuck in the middle over here between the two people, what, what he should be doing. So even though, okay, even though obviously Sarah was a tzedekis, right, Sarah is a big tzedekis, but nevertheless... <clears throat> she didn't like the fact that Hagar was mistreating her. But the Mephoshim asked a very interesting question. Sarah was such a great tzaddik, okay? Tzaddikis. Tzaddikis, okay. Um, okay, so she said like this. That Sarah never changed her behavior. She was always the right guy. But Hagar was the one that did it. Meaning like this. He gives a marshal that if a, a great rabbi tells his students to do something, and another thing, and another thing, because of respect for the great man, they'll do it. They'll do it. Sarah used to tell Hagar to do things. Now Hagar belittles Sarah... She said, I'm not interested in working for you anymore like this. You know, if it's a great person, he tells you again and again to do things, you'll do it out of respect for him. A regular person, you're not going to listen to like that. So Hagar is saying, in other words, the, the Mephosh commentary has explained that Hagar's behavior changed. She didn't listen to Sarah anymore. Sarah didn't change. She was telling what to do, and she, and she didn't listen. Huh? I know, but she blamed her. She blamed her. Because the Mephoshim asked, because if Sarah mistreated her, like it seems simply that she mistreated her, why did the angel, as was soon as the angel told her, go back to Sarah's house? If she mistreated her, it's not fair to make her go back home. So obviously Sarah didn't change. Hogger changed. So Hogger started wearing dark glasses, so to speak, so everything became uh, black. Okay, so he says like this. 
in your hand, meaning you are in control of her. It's your maid servant, you never set her free. Asila Do what's good in your eyes. But Sarai, Sarai dealt with her harshly. But mi Panel and she ran away. The Madri says like this, Rabbeinu uh, Barachia says, what did Sarah do? She smacked, she slapped her with a slipper. She actually hit her in the face. Um, or, Rabbi said, she made her carry water buckets and bath towels to the bath, which is servant's work. So therefore, Sarah started making her do work, which was unfit for the wife of Avram. You're not allowed to make... Not for the maid. Right. In other words, she gave her jobs that were fit for a, a, a Goyish maid rather than a Yiddish girl who was the wife of Avram Avinu. Okay. Another other thing Mepharshim say, that's what Ramban says. Other Mepharshim say that Sarah did not mean God forbid, malicious or evil or, you know, bad. She was a holy girl. What did she do it for? Because she wanted Hagar to become subordinate to her. That's it. She didn't do it out of maliciousness and anger. And she said, you're not listening to me. You've got to listen to me. That's it. You're my maidservant. You still have to listen. I ate a wife of Avram, but you're my maidservant first. And that's why she did it. Okay. And she ran away. So the first one explained, why did she run away? She said, a woman who's married to Avram should not be treated like a slave. Very simple. Sarah started treating her like a slave. So she said, it's not befitting, Hagar said, it's not befitting for a wife of Avram to run away, I mean, to be treated like a slave. So she ran away. Um... Now, the Mepharshim say, I mean, they, even though Potsik doesn't say it, Avram didn't run after her. When, when she ran away from the house, in other words, it was right far away from him. Why didn't Avram chase her? He said, out of respect to Sarah, he didn't go chase her. And therefore, Avram let be, said, let be what be, you know. Whatever happens, let it happen. It's not going to... Okay, so she ran away. Malach Hashem, and an angel of Hashem found her. Al Mayim by a spring of water Bamidbar in the desert. Al Ayin on the spring on the road to the city of Shur. Just a city in there. Okay. Now, what do you mean? Think about it. Is this prophecy? Is this not prophecy? The angel is revealing himself to Sarai. Yeah? She's a non-Jewish girl. How in the world can a malach, an angel, reveal himself to her? So the Ramban says, in, and I'm sorry, the Rambam, the Rambam is a very interesting opinion, Bechlal. All the stories in Tanakh, I mean, in Chumash, Breshis, the Rambam, in Meir and Nebuchim, say it was a prophecy of Avram Avinu in a dream. It never really happened. It goes to Rambam. Um, all this have prophetic vision for one should not imagine that an angel should come to Hagar. Okay? Most people say no. The angel did come to Hashem, sent, her, sent the angel down to help Hagar, so it happened. It's very interesting. You know the whole story with the angels coming in this week's part, this not this one, this week's part show. The angels came, three angels came to Avram and he brought them, brought them food. Yeah? So the Rambam in Meinu Nebuchim says it never happened. It was all a Nebuah. The Yero El of Hashem, Hashem appeared to Avram. The Yisra El of Ayar, it was all in a vision. The Rambam, right? In Meir Nebuchim, he says this, in philosophy, so to speak. It was all in a dream, in a vision of prophecy. The angels never physically came. And he, 
almost everybody else disagrees with the Rambam. And they say all these stories. So the thing the Rambam says over here, this was an image of prophecy. It didn't happen that the angel actually came to her. Because he, he says, how can an angel come to uh, this hogger? Angel huh? Angel Bilaam. Bilaam was a unique situation because God said he's going to give prophecy to, to a non-Jew, but that was only Bilaam. Even though God appeared to Lavan and God appeared to different people, right? But but the, Torah, but the Torah specifically, like for example, Yaakov, you know, we had the prophecy. It says he went to sleep first. Yeah. So everybody he, except Meshur Rabbeinu had prophecy during their sleep. But the thing is, is that so what, he, he was never awake. The whole story is which story of Yaakov, you know, or anyone? No, not the story. Yaakov took care of sheep. I mean, he took care of Lovin's house. I'm just saying that Rambam writes that the, like the three malachim was a, a vision that he saw at night that never really happened. Okay. Now, um, okay. Angels do communicate with men. This is what everybody else disagrees with. Rambam. Now, there's different levels. <laughs> there's a very interesting Gemara in Saita. The Gemara says the, the rabbis were once sitting in a certain attic in the days of Hillel. And the, the Gemara says a voice came out from heaven, a basco came out from heaven, and it says Gemara and Saita, the voice came out from heaven and said, one of you are fit for prophecy, to hear prophecy, but the generation is not worthy. Then another time they were sitting, and everybody looked at Hillel. And they said, hey, Hillel, honor the Talmud of the student of Ezra. Everybody looked at Hillel. Then another time they were sitting, and they did the same thing, and everybody looked at uh, Shmuel Akata, who was the student of Rabbi Gamliel, who made the Brach Lamal Shinim that we added, the 19th Brach, which was added. It was made by Shmuel Akata, who was the disciple of Rabbi, Rabbi Gamliel. So, but in other words, like this, you have, and don't ask me what it means because I'm not uh, into this. I mean, I don't, I don't know because I don't got it. There's prophecy, right? There's Baskel, a voice comes out from heaven and people heard things. That obviously is not the same level as the Not right now, is it? No, these things, well, not really, no. Um, it's a, in other words, like this, like it, it says over here, Bas Kol is a physical sound that can be actually heard in accordance with Hashem's will. So, say in fear to prophecy, she actually perceived the angel in a form of a, of a human being. Okay? Because in the merit of Avram Avinu, <laughs> Hashem showed her a vision of an angel that came to the well and told her what he's, what we're going to learn in a minute. Okay? Um, now, that what's another interesting thing, the Mepharshim asked another interesting question, just in the expression of the Pasik. In Pasik, Zion, it says, Vayim Malach Hashem. An angel found her. When you say, I found you, that means I was looking for you. And then I got you. Why would an angel have to look? It's a funny expression. An angel of Hashem found. It should say, uh, the angel appeared. Why does it say found? Because it says, Hashem was waiting for Hagar, okay, to to be bitter enough at the well and that's the time Hashem said I'm going to reveal to her through the angel. So in other words, Vayim Tsa'a implies the way the Mephoshim explained that he, he wasn't that the angel went straight to her. The angel found him meaning Hashem was waiting for Hagar to reach a certain place, this well or whatever it is, and then the angel was going to come and reveal himself to her. 
Meaning, at that time, she was ready for divine revelation. Obviously, she was broken, right? If she was broken, then that's when you get the revelation of godliness. A broken heart, a broken spirit. Okay, now, the Radak says, the fact that it says where she was in the desert, and on the well of, uh, on the way to Shur, the Radak says, she was pushed going home to Egypt. Based on the geography of the place, the Radak says that the fact that the angel found her, why isn't her telling us this? What's the name of where he found her? Found her, in the, in the desert he found her. Why did it say on the, next to the well and the, the way to short? Because they explained she was tackled going back home to Egypt, to Paris' house. She was pregnant too. She, she was pregnant, of course. Uh, no, he wasn't born yet. That's later on, next parsha. Ah. It was after Yishma was born and making problems with Yitzchak. Then Avram threw him out of the house. Then that's when the the. But no, the, she was she was pregnant. Which one is considered what uh, Avram's test? This one or the one later? I don't. This is not considered a test of Avram. It's not one of the nine tests. I don't think so. One, I know one of them is sitting each mile away, right? Could be. According I remember now. Huh? According to one opinion. Yeah, so, yeah but I remember the, in the Mishnah, take a Mishnah, which we don't have here. The Mishnah is okay, right away all the ten. And, the and even the ten is a machlekes. Sending each away when he didn't have another son, they said it was one of the tests. Yeah. But he wasn't even born yet. Not here. Okay. okay, so Yomar, so the angel see, comes to her, sees her, and he says, Hagar Shivcha Sarai, Ezemi Baz Vanasilech. Where are you coming from? But he listened to the Malak said. Hagar Shivcha Sara. Why did the angel tell her this? The angel said to her, remember, you're still a maidservant. The angel himself was speaking from God, for God. He says, remember, Hine, the um, Haga, so what did he say? Haga Shivcha Sara, the maidservant of Sara, Meza Bas, where are you coming from? And Anasei Lechi. So the Medrash HaGadol says an interesting thing. As far as Sarah is concerned, and this is what the Malach said, as far as Sarah is concerned, she wasn't Avram's wife. She was only Avram's wife as far as Avram was concerned. As far as Sarah was concerned, or Sarah was concerned, she was only just a plain old maidservant who happened to live with her husband to have a child. But she wasn't a, maid, wasn't a wife at all. Okay, secondly, Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says that what's the Malach telling her this? That this that happened came from God. This whole story that you were, that you were tor tortured and you ran away, that all came from, from Hashem himself. Okay. Um, okay, so he said, where do you come from and where are you going? So Rashi asks, didn't the Malach know where she was coming and going? Was he asking a question? Where are you coming from and where are you going? So Rashi says, very simple. This is just to open a conversation. Like when Hashem said to Avram, Ayako, where are you? He knew where he was. He just said, to open, Rashi says, to open a conversation. To Adam? To Adam, yeah. After the sin, Hashem came and he said, okay, there's a word to Dalt Rebbe, you know, where are you in life and that. But sim, sim, simply, Rashi says, Hashem came, he, of course he knew where Avram Avinu was, but he had to open a conversation. Right? So how do you hello, how are you? Even though people call you on the phone, hello, how are you? And they don't even bother waiting for the answer. If they really cared, how are you, then at least wait for an answer. Right? So, so why do people say, hi, how are you? They're not interested in the question or the answer. How do you, that's the way you open a conversation. Hi, how are you? I mean, so he says, where, where are you coming from? Where are you going? 
but not that he didn't know, God forbid. But Taima, she said, Oh, another thing. What was it? Perik But another thing, another thing the Malach, the, the Sifuna says, there's another deeper meaning here. What the Malach said, to, where was Hagar running now? Back to power, back to tumba, back to impurity, back to evil. So he says to her, where are you coming from? Look, where are you coming from? A place of holiness, Kedusha. And where are you going? Back to a place of Tumba. What's wrong with you? It wasn't Stam a question. See, simply Rashi says it's to start the conversation. Right? Where are you going? But Dak says no deeper. Because in Pshat, that's what it means. Uh, well, where are you coming from? Where are you going? The Malach. So it's just to start the conversation. But Radak says, no, there's a deeper meaning over here. Where are you coming? Do you think about it? Where are you coming from? And where are you going? You're coming from a place of Avraham Avinu, a place of Kedusha. So the Malbim says, what did the Malach want? Before telling her explicitly, he wanted her that she should understand she needs to go back to Avraham. Instead of going home to party. Huh? Hover. <laughs> Okay, but Taiman she said, okay, Mibnei Sare Givirti Anechi Perachas. I'm going away from my sorry, my sorry, my mistress. No, I'm running away from her. Now it's interesting, the Mephoshim point out, Hogar, because she was in Avram Avinu's house, was accustomed to seeing angels. It wasn't a shocker for her. Even light. Later on in Pasha's Vayed, on this coming Pasha, the, the, the light was accustomed to seeing angels in Avraham Avinu's house. It wasn't a big uh, shocker for him to see an angel. So therefore she spoke openly, so to speak, with the angel. The angel said, where are you going, where are you coming? And she said, I'm running away, because she was accustomed to angels. Which itself, by the way, if you think about it, it's a very great level. That she, that this girl, you know, Avraham Avinu, had angels coming, that doesn't mean everybody else in the house had to see them. I just didn't see them. Huh? Oh. Is it holy lady? What? The holy lady? Yeah, she, listen, the truth is, she was a holy lady. She was? She was, to the... She did tshuva. She did She never sinned. No. No, Yishmo did tshuva. Yishmo was... But the also her, she... She, she, did, she was not, I don't know, she, she was she, always good. She, okay, so she was belittling Sarah. And, and by the way, if you want to take it as a positive spin, I don't see anybody say it here, but there's a Gemara that says, Penina, Vahasotno, Shem Shemaim Neskavnu. Penina, the, 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 the Medri says, Penina with Chana, right? So Penina, a lot of kids, and Chana didn't. So Penina would make fun of Chana. You see, I have kids and you don't. So the Gemara says, Chas Vashon Penina was a very special holy lady. Why did she make fun of Chana? Because she wanted her to be broken, to daven more, to be answered. The same thing the Satan. That's the Gemara says, the Satan Hashem Shemaim is Katna. The Yetzirah tries to get you to sin. He really means you shouldn't sin. The Eitzahara doesn't want you to sin. He's uh, the messenger of God. But he convinces you to sin with all his might and power, hoping that you won't listen to him. Usually what we end up doing is listening to him. But that's what we end up doing. But, so this is, so it could be, it could be that this, that Hago is making fun of Sarai to give a positive spin on it, could be because she just wanted Sarai to have more. And then she would marry to have children. And that was the ultimate goal that she had. Okay. Um,
they, they bring down over here. There's a there's a Gemara and Bava Kama that says a certain proverb. If your neighbor calls you a donkey, put a saddle on your back. <laughs> what does it mean? He says, um, thus after the angel called Sarah the handmaid, right? She responded by referring to Sarah as my mistress. In other words, once the Malach called her a donkey, a maidservant, you know, so she had to understand that uh, Sarah was uh, her mistress, uh, the one in charge of her. Okay. The Yem Elohim Malach Hashem. And the angel said to her again, Shuvi al Givirtech. What's interesting, Shamshim Fol Hirsch points out, is a bunch of, it's interesting, Pasik Ches says the angel spoke to her. Correct? Then in Pasik Tess it says the angel spoke to her. And in Pasik Yud it says the angel spoke to her. Yud Aleph too. Huh? Yud Aleph too. Yud Aleph too. Now, why? It wasn't that. Okay, in the first Pasik he asked a question, so she had to give him an answer. Okay, so then it makes sense to say the Malach spoke to her again. But after that's done, Sarah, I mean, Hagar is not answering to any questions. The Malach says the one thing, go back. Then the Malach says to her, you're going to have a lot of children. And then the Malach says to her, you're pregnant and you're going to have a son. Why is the Malach, why is the Torah saying three times that the Torah is going to put it all together? The Malach said to her, number one, go back. Number two, you're going to have uh, a lot of children. And thirdly, you're pregnant. Why every time it says the Malach said to her, the Malach said to her, why is it three times? So Shamshin Falher says it's the condition, the promise, and the task. Okay? But simply you could also say they give her more reward. Another time, another time. It wasn't one continuation. I mean, it, it, it happened at the same time, it didn't happen weeks apart. But nevertheless, every time was a new revelation. That the Malach revealed himself to Sarah. At the Hogger, I mean. So it was a different angel? Or? No, it doesn't look like it. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong. That Rashi says. Yep. Rashi says, I'll call Amira Ho Yeshiluch La Malach Achad. See, Rashi answers the question very simply. You know why it says three times or four times the Malach spoke to her? There's a different Malach each time. Bashi says from the Medrash, from the Bereshus Rabbah, that it was Taka, a different Malach every time. Which again is, shows her greatness. She merited, you know, three Malachim. Now, and Farshim explained why did it have to be a different malach? Why did it have to be a different angel? So we know a rule, in fact in this week's passage with the three angels that came to Avram, one angel cannot do two missions. An angel can only do one mission. Right? So one malach said, go back. That's one mission. What you should be doing. The second one is the bracha, what's going to happen. And the third one is uh, the fact that you're pregnant. So each one is a different mission. So you couldn't have the same malach do the same mission three times. So therefore every time was a different angel. Okay, so Pasik test. The Yemen la malach Hashem shuvi al go back to your mistress, to Sarai. Visani Yadachan submit to her domination. In other words, get used to it. Supposedly, go back and it is what it is. But Yemelo Malach Hashem, and the Malach of Hashem said to her like this. And the Mufarshim says, the Radak says, what happens is she didn't move. He said to her, go back. And it doesn't say she started going back. So the Malach had to coax her again by saying, Harba Arba Zarech. Okay? Um, okay.
Okay, there's one interesting commentary over here that says that she went back and then the other malachim told her what they told her. You're going to have a lot of uh, kids, you're pregnant. So that was after Shitaka went back. Okay. So he says, you're going to have a lot of arba arba zarein zareich. What is it? Arba zarein zareich. I'm going to increase your offspring. Okay. Um, and they won't be, it'll be so great, you won't be able to count. Now, the obvious question is, angels don't give children. What did the angel say to her? Harba arbe ezareich. I will make your children a lot. How could an angel say, I will make your children a lot? The Hashem is doing it. But then again, the answer is, he's speaking in the name of Hashem. There's a famous question in the second paragraph of Shema. You know, and they have to understand, Chumish Devarim, the whole book of Devarim, Meishe Rabbeinu is speaking. It's not Hashem to Meishe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Hashem or Meishe Rabbeinu, right? Ela Advarim, the whole book of Devarim is Meishe Rabbeinu speaking to the Jewish people. Yeah? So he says, Shema Yisra Hashem Aken Hashem Echad, V'yohavta. And then he says, V'ayim Shemei Atishmo Mitzvah, he said, you listen to my mitzvahs, right? And then he says, V'nasati Gishmeichem V'itam. Before that, I will give grass in your fields for your animals, right? And you'll eat them before. So the first you ask, Meshe Rabbeinu gives grass? Meshe Rabbeinu is speaking Dvarim. It's not Hashem speaking to Meshe Rabbeinu dictating. Meshe Rabbeinu is saying Chumash Dvarim. So the first the Medrash says, how is it possible that Meshe Rabbeinu said, V'nasati Eisev, I'm giving, V'nasati Gishmeichem, I'm going to be giving, what, you know, how could that be? So the Medrash answers, a very famous expression, Shechina medaberes mitech, g'reine shal Meshe. The Shechina spoke through the throat of Meshe Rabbeinu. In other words, the Medrash says, Meshe Rabbeinu is only God's microphone. So when Meshe Rabbeinu said, I'm going to give grass, it's not the microphone saying, I'm going to give grass. The person speaking through the microphone is the one giving the grass. So the Medrash says, the Shekhinah spoke through Meshe Rabbeinu's throat, which means whatever Meshe Rabbeinu said in Dvarim is straight from Hashem. So therefore, the same thing over here. When the Malach says to Hagar, I'm going to make a lot of you, you're going to have a lot of children, it doesn't mean him, it means... Hashem is going to do it. Okay, see, then he says like this. The Malach says to her again, Behold, Hina behold, you're uh, pregnant. Behold, you're lighted bane, and you're going to give birth to a child, a son, in fact. Okay? Um, now, by the way, it's interesting. This is not, not well, it's known because Rashi brings it down. What is, according to Rashi, when the Malach said, Hina Chara V'yoladet Bain, he didn't say, look, if you look in the English, behold, you will conceive. Hina, according to Rashi, Hina Chara doesn't mean you are, you, you did conceive, you will conceive. What happened over here? Sarah was angry at Hagar. She gave this Ayin Hara and she miscarried. Hagar actually miscarried the first baby. Because Sarah was upset. And when a tzaddik, tzaddik is, is upset, things happen. Okay, like we find all over the Gemara. So the Malach says to her, Hina Chari, you will conceive. Like it says, what is saying this one also, I'm sure. Um, so Nishmaya was not there. You will conceive, even in English, you will conceive. The question is, she's pregnant already. What do you mean you will conceive? The answer is she wasn't pregnant anymore. She lost the baby. So now the Malach... What? Hello? I thought she was... See, so says to you will conceive. Okay? Uh, and you're going to give birth to a son. Um, now, the same thing, by the way, they prove it. How do you know Hinochar means the future? 
because you know the Shimshim Menayach story, Eishes Menayach, and mm. uh, right. So over there, the expression is also Hina Chari Yer Ladet Bein, and it means over there definitely you will conceive a child. She wasn't pregnant then. Shimshim's mother. So they say the same thing over here. Hina Chari, you will conceive because she lost the first baby. So she, when she was pregnant, she went back to Sarah. Uh, Sarah's house. No. When the angel told her to go home, back to Sarah, she was not pregnant. She became pregnant after she came back with Avram again. He lost the baby. Before she ran away. Either or on the way. On the way, running away. That's what the implication is. That And then the Malach says, you will conceive. And let's go back to Sarah. You'll be with Avram again and you'll conceive again. Then but, she was better with Sarah? Huh? Then she was better with Sarah? Yep. Best friends. Then they went up to the movies together. They did. They went to the restaurants together. They did a lot of... Shopping. Shop. Shop. But they all drive there. <laughs> What do you think they did? Okay. The Karas Shema Yishmael. And now it's interesting. The angel is telling you what name to name the baby. At the end of the parsha, when Avram named him Yishmael, he didn't know that the Malach told her to name him Yishmael. Avram had his own prophecy to name the baby Yishmael. Why? The Karas Shema Yishmael. You should call him Yishmael. Because Hashem heard your prayer, your impression, uh, the cries that you had. Um, okay, now what it means is like this. And Rashi said, Rashi says, the Malach commanded her, it was a commandment, to name the baby Yishmol. Okay? Now the Ramban says, it wasn't a command. Ramban says, I judged the Karas, you will call him son, your son Yishmael. So Rashi says, Hashem the Malach told him, you have, that's, I'm commanding you to call the kid Yishmael. The Ramban learns it's not a commandment. The, the Malach is telling Sarah, I'm prophecy, you're going to call the kid Yishmael. Ki shama Hashem al onyech, because Hashem heard your affliction. Okay? Now, onyech normally means affliction, um, crying, the various different things of oni, right? But oni also comes to the word one. Huh? Answering. answering, what's your prayer? The concept of davening is to ask and answer. Okay, we'll learn one more possible. He will be a wild ass of a man, or like a wild ass amongst men the Targum says what up um, okay Huyi um, Apera Adam is going to be a wild ass of men Yodei Bakel his hand against everyone the Yad Kobay and everyone's hand against him Meaning, he's not going to have too many friends. <laughs> Everybody's going to hate him. He's going to hate everybody. He will be a plunderer, the doc, the doc says. Uh, the Ramban says he's, his children are going to go to war against everybody. Uh, you know, it's basically uh, a vil de chaya, you know? I have a question about what? that. So, in my imagination, I would think that Harker would say, but I don't want a son like that. I don't, that's like you know, like, but she didn't. She didn't say anything. Why didn't she say anything? Because like, beggars can't be choosy. <laughs> <laughs> beggars can't be choosy. <coughs> How do you know she didn't say anything? Well, there may not be a lesson there to teach it, but I mean, uh, you know. I don't know, maybe that a person should call out to Hashem and say, but I want change that. Like. Because Hogger understood that if an angel is saying it, it's coming from Hashem. What should she say? Is it the same concept like that they were also by Rivka that she would have yeah. also a son? Yeah. 
Wait. Did Rivka Davin not have uh, half of her pregnancy? Did Rivka Davin that Asaf shouldn't be born? No. There's a very there's a very famous story with Menashe. Was one of the I'm sorry. Chizkiah Melech, one of the kings. Of the, okay, Chizkiah Melech was a very great tzaddik. Gemara says in Sanhedrin, "Bika shakosh bochel lasis Chizkiah Mashiach." So he wanted to make Chizkiah Mashiach. Why didn't he? Because he didn't sing praise when San, when the Sanhedrin had his downfall. They didn't sing Shira. Okay. So it says, Chizkiah was a navi. He was a king, but he was a navi. He foresaw that he's going to have a wicked son by the name of Menashe, who was this king that called all the, caused all the Jews to worship idols. He was Chizkiah Melech's son. So Chizkiah said, why am, I get, why am I getting married? I have such a son, I don't want to get married. Okay? So the Navi came to him, Yeshaya Navi came to him, and said to him, God said, you better get married, or else you're finished. So Chizkiya Melech said to him, Kali finish your prophecy and get out of here. So you have a prophecy to do? Good, okay. Anyway, so Chizkiya, then he turned to the wall, and he davened to Hashem, and he said to Yeshai, you know what? Let me marry your daughter. So maybe in your school, so my school, so maybe together we'll undo this, uh, this Russia. But you can't, uh, Hashem does it. He, he, there's not anything he can, can always do just to undo it. It doesn't work like that. He still did have a Russia? Yeah, Menashe was his son. 